How's it going? Um, <laughs> I have never given a presentation at a pulpit before. And I don't know, just a little bit about me. I don't do very well in like formal or like uniform situations. So I'm going to try to mix things up a little bit to help me relax. Um, let's see. First off, I'm going to rearrange a few things. And instead of doing Q&A at the end, I'm just going to kind of do it like right off the bat from the beginning. I'll give a little bit of a brief intro and then we're going to do Q&A kind of more throughout it instead of waiting till the end. And then one last thing before we begin. This is more for me and my personal journal. Um, all right, let's do that. Okay. I think I'm ready to get started now. Okay. So, my name is Gary G. Come from Provo, Utah. Really excited to be here uh, at your gorgeous campus. And that is my beautiful wife, Jessica. And if you can see in the picture, I actually have brown hair. It's just natural brown. Um, just kidding. My wife has purple hair in that picture. And then this is our darling little Dorothy 7G. Dorothy being my grandma, her great grandma. Seven being the number I wear on my soccer jersey and her middle name and then G, our last name. So getting into the story of things, I created an iPhone app. I had an idea and it like, came to life. That would be my first question for you guys. Like, Who in here has ever had an idea for an app, an invention, a product, a business? Anybody in here by raise of hand have an idea for something of the sort? So really all this is that I'm about to tell you, it's just a simple story of someone who had an idea and worked hard to make that idea a reality. And so let me bring this up. So go back two and a half, almost three years ago. And I mean, go way back to the days when I used to still go to class. Like, yeah, it was about two and a half years ago. And that's where this all started. I was in an entrepreneurial class, not too different from this, and I had an idea for a cool product. I saw QR code technology, and I saw smartphones just, you know, t basically taking over, and I thought, how cool would it be if the entire world was scannable, where if I wanted more information about anything, I could scan that product, that build, like whatever it is, I could scan it and get more information about it. I thought it was a really cool idea. So um, that was about Christmas time because that's when I got my first smartphone. Like I myself am not a very techie person. I was playing soccer, I was at this time uh, dating my wife, and that was basically my life. Like there wasn't the techie side of things, there wasn't a business side to my life until I got my first smartphone and I had this idea and that's when everything changed. So then, I, learned, I took a year and I learned the skills to build this product. That was one of the most important steps of this whole timeline is the fact that I had an idea and I didn't have the skills, the design and development skills to build the app I wanted to build and that just frustrated me. That just killed me inside to have an idea and not be able to bring it to life myself. So I teamed up with two people on campus who could help me build it and the three of us just got to work out of our dorm room. So it was early 2011 when we launched the first version of our product, okay? We launched two things. We launched an iPhone app and we launched a website. And then we just kind of, I don't know, sat back and watched what was going to happen next. And I didn't know, this being my first app, I didn't know what was good or what was bad. But I was really excited to have something I created on my iPhone. I remember the first night I saw it on my iPhone, I kept taking screenshots of it because I thought it was so cool to have something that was in my head actually on my iPhone. Anyways, that night I went to a party, BYU campus, and I was literally like yelling at people to download my app that I was so excited to have. And that night I got a whole whopping 12 people to download my app. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever, that now my app had already been tw downloaded 12 times its first night. But I got together with my uh, two co-founder buddies, Ben and Kirk, the next morning and was bragging to them like, hey guys, I got 12 people to download our app last night. Anyways, they pulled up the analytics and our very first night we had 2,000 people download our app. 
And that's when I realized the app store is a lot more powerful than me on the table screaming at a party to download my app. Um, anyways, it just quickly started to grow where our first night we got 2,000 downloads, then we got 5,000 downloads until, I mean, to date we get a little more over 100,000 downloads a day. There's only 83 seconds in a day, so getting a little more than a download a second with our app without me having to be up on a table screaming at people at a party to download my app. Anyways, it was about three months into this that we got our first one million downloads. And that's when investors started reaching out to us, saying, we want to meet with you. And I didn't know who investors were or how they worked, but I had seen the TV show Shark Tank, coincidentally. And in that TV show, like, sharks are jerks, right? They're just mean people. So when these investors were emailing me or calling me, I was like, I don't want to talk to you. You're not nice people. Um, and so I just wasn't returning their phone calls, wasn't responding to their emails, until more recognizable names reached out like Google and Facebook and others. And that's when we started taking our first meetings with investors. We flew out to San Francisco, um, and one good meeting led to another good meeting. Anyways, friends of investors would introduce us to other investors until eventually I found myself meeting with the likes of Ashton Kutcher and Scooter Braun and Lady Gaga. And the whole time, you know, I was shocked to be this young guy from a small town in Provo, Utah, meeting with these people who wanted to invest in my idea. I just thought it was the craziest thing ever. Anyways, I ended up taking $1.7 million from these investors to then take my idea and take it to the next level, right? That was our seed round. Anyways, when that happened, I dropped out of school, um, left the soccer team, and moved to San Francisco. And my wife, my team, and I we moved to San Francisco and were there for about a year of adventure where we did nothing, absolutely nothing, but just worked as hard as we could to make this app and this business as big as possible. Um, as it started to grow, you know, past 10 million users, it passed 25 million users. And again, more investors started talking to us like, hey, we want to buy more of your business. Um, you know, how much of your business would you be willing to sell? Anyways, I got a phone call from a group in London saying, if you will sell us this percentage of your business, we will give you $5 million. And that was after like a 20 minute phone call. And I was like, you guys are going to offer me $5 million for a little percentage of my business and you haven't even met me in person. They're like, well, yeah, we should make this official. Why don't you meet with us? What are you doing tomorrow? Anyways, they flew me and my co-founder. They wanted to fly the three of us, but one didn't have a passport. I never left the country. So two of us went to London and in 24 hours did a deal where they ended up giving us $7 million for a percentage of our company. And that was um, almost a year ago. Anyways, and then... When we did that, I decided, okay, with this money, I think we can now move back to small town Provo, where I would like to reapply to BYU, return to the soccer team, and continue building the business from there. Um, and then it was about, what now, three, maybe four weeks ago that our company appeared on Shark Tank. So I guess the moral of, the company, or of this short little story in my eyes was, it's amazing that with entrepreneurship, you can go from an idea and you can take it to primetime television on Shark Tank. Anyways, you can see there, that was what, three years in five minutes. And so now I'd want to informally open this up to you guys and see where along this timeline would you want to, would, would you want to hear more about? Like what would be more valuable to you guys? I'm here to hopefully in some way benefit you guys, and so yeah, you tell me where I could uh, answer questions, and we'll start here in the hat. Uh, yeah, Gary, thanks for coming. I can't understand. I, just, I had a question about the last point, Shark Tank. There's something you said on Shark Tank, how you kind of branded yourself and something you uh, asked to the sharks. You said they were foolish twice in like describing yourself and like describing them. Like, are you foolish enough, aka smart enough, to like invest in me? And I felt like the sharks definitely knew what you were talking about when you said that. And I kind of did, but I, I really like respected like your idea behind like, Can you elaborate more what you mean foolish enough and what does that really play into it being a startup? Cool. So the question is, um, just to repeat it, when I was on the TV show Shark Tank, I kind of referred to myself and just 
in general, like an entrepreneur's necessity to be foolish. And that honestly has made one of the biggest differences throughout all of this. Because if you look at any great idea or great company, when it was just an idea, it was a foolish idea to most people, you know? Uh, I think just the typical example is the inventor of the light bulb. Like, how foolish did it sound at the time to walk into a room, flip a switch, and all of a sudden there's a light, you know? Like, that was definitely irrational and foolish. Anyways, he made it a reality. And I don't know if you'd call it, like, naive or foolish or irrational, but whatever that is, like, that's definitely something that is so uh, necessary in the, in the journey of uh, creating your own venture, or really anything entrepreneurial. And so, yeah, when I went on Shark Tank, I actually, so if you've seen the episode, <laughs> I uh, was made fun of for wearing these uh, sandals, right? And even before I went on, they're like, so what are you going to wear? Are you, are you going to go change into your suit right now? I was like, oh, no, I'm ready. And they're like, okay, well, you'll have five minutes before you go on to change. And I'm like, no, this is what I'm wearing, you know, like, I'm just myself. I'm wearing my sandals. And a lot of people were saying, like, well, that's kind of foolish. Like, you're going to ask for a million dollars on TV while just wearing sandals? Anyways, um, what ended up happening is my, my pitch or mine was one of, like, five on the episode. Anyways they uh, ended up using, like, these sandals as the promo the whole, like, month and week leading up to the episode, talking about, like, there is some crazy kid asking for a million dollars on live TV in sandals. Anyways, that, like, l that foolish idea, something as small as that, led to us getting, like, not just exposure during our episode, but the whole time leading up to that, we were getting extra exposure. Again, just a foolish idea, you know, benefiting an entrepreneurial path. Um, let's go to the next, yeah. Did you really want that money or did you just want the exposure? Good question. So did I want the money from Shark Tank or was I just there for the exposure? So when they first reached out to me, I was immediately excited about the potential exposure. To have my app, you know, be seen by people all around the world on primetime television. I thought that was amazing. Um, but then obviously I needed to decide, like, is this actually something smart for me to, for me to do? Uh, if you've seen the TV show, a lot of the ideas or businesses that go on there are kind of more like quirky mom and pop businesses, right? And like, I didn't, I didn't know if I wanted my, my app to be seen as just kind of this like, TV, quirky, business, you know, might get a deal, might not get a deal. Um, anyways, when I did my research and I looked, like, the sharks, the investors that they have on that show, like, every single one of them could bring real value into my business. And then, as far as the exposure and looking quirky or not, I felt, you know, that just comes down to me. If I can do a good job of presenting my business and myself how I want to, then... You know, hopefully they won't be able to do too much editing to make me look as horrible as possible. And, I mean, just to speak to that, I was horribly scared. Like, when I went on the show, I've done quite a bit of this, like, speaking in front of groups, but it was a whole different thing. And especially, like, meeting in front of investors. I know my company front to back, and so if an investor is going to ask me a question, like, I have no problem answering that. But when you're on TV and there's the cameras and the lights and everything and I'm worried about my posture and my smile the whole time and then also trying to focus about the questions, like that was a whole other game and that was super scary. Anyways, uh, on TV, what, <coughs> it showed me for five, maybe ten minutes. When I was actually there on camera in front of the sharks, it was more like an hour and 40 minutes. And so knowing that they had an hour and 40 minutes of me that they could pull from and edit however they want to make me look however they want, that was pretty scary. Anyway, so when I found out that it was going to be on TV, which was only two weeks before the actual air date, I just for two weeks stressed, really like couldn't sleep well because I, I just didn't know like how it was going to be portrayed, how my business was going to end up. Um, anyways, if you saw the episode, we ended up not doing a deal with the Sharks, but um, I, was, I was like, I think they did a good job of portraying how it actually went down, what the Sharks did like about me, what they didn't about me. Anyways, and then to finalize with your question, um, we, we didn't need the cash. Had we, like, yes, 
we want a million dollars, <laughs> never a bad thing. Um, without it, our business wasn't gonna flop and fail because of the other money we had raised before the show. Um, but more importantly, and kind of what I tried to tell the sharks on the show is, it just makes sense, it's simple math. Like if you can give away this much of your business and get this much value in return, then it's gonna be a smart deal. And those were impressive investors that are on the TV show, every one of them being able to bring like a ton of value into the business. So to bring one of them on board and just give them a little bit of my company, like I was more than willing to do that. So that's kind of how it uh, turned out. Yes. Why, so is the question more, why are there so many apps being added to the app store? No, or? Why you feel your so okay, okay. Yeah, so the question is, in such a very crowded space with so many apps um, being added to the app store, how were we able to stand out? How did I feel that was able to happen? Because when we submitted our app scan into the app store, let me pull this up. When we, um, let's see here. When we submitted our app scan into the App Store, there were maybe a little over 300 other scanning apps. Not just other apps to compete with, but other scanning apps. And again, being a little foolish and a little irrational, we really were confident that we could build the best one. Um, other apps, we didn't like something as little as like the way they were named, how the icon looked, they were a little more difficult to use, and so we just felt people weren't doing it quite right. Right? And so we thought, if we can execute well and make ours the fastest, if we can make the design more simple and beautiful, and then we can give it a better name, that we could rise to the top. And again, that was just like young boys in a dorm room thinking irrationally. Um, even to date, there's something like 3,700 other scanning apps in the App Store. Anyways, um, like, I'd probably say that if you were to build an app, there's, you know, like, not a perfect recipe on do this, 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 and your app will be a success. But, you know, if there were that laundry list of items, I think we executed very well, you know, on, on all 10 things from having a good name, simplicity, whatever. Um, but then from, from there on, it really is like a gamble. That's why companies like Facebook or, you know, big companies can put out an app and even their apps won't do well. If anyone remembers like the Facebook app Poke, they put it out, their Facebook, you know, they tried to compete with Snapchat, and even that, like, didn't quite work out for them. Um, but if I were to say maybe the three things I felt we did well as an app was first, the name. We understood that if people are going to download a scanning app, they're going to open up their phone, go to the app store, and they're going to search for something. They're either going to search for scan or barcode or QR code, something of the sort, right? And so by ranking well for those terms and being more like discoverable, people all over the world who are seeing codes and wanting to scan them, they would open up their phone, they would search it, and that would pull up, right? Anyway, so yeah, being, uh, having a good name and being more discoverable. And then, uh, and then just being more simple. Like, that would probably be one of the bigger things is so many people when they build an app, they try to pump so many like features and details into something, and all we did was scan it first. We just did a very simple app, and again, nothing else but scanning. And that, like, people could grasp that. Okay, I just want to scan things. This app does nothing but scan. Let's start there. And um, anyways, yeah, so we just started dead simple. Let me go back to, all right. Yeah, so is that, is that uh, we're gonna have to go through this. Um, Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. What was the deciding factor when you said, there's a market for this app and I can drop out of school and I can do this app? The deciding factor for me to like pursue the app or the deciding factor to drop out of school? When you could commit to taking your life away from what it was. Ah, that's a good question. So the question is, at what point could I like f step away from my current life and fully focus on this idea? Ah, that's a really good question. Um, 
because obviously it kind of happens like gradually, but because I would say I think that's like one of the number one things that keeps people from pursuing an entrepreneurial idea or venture is just kind of that fear of like, uh, do I step away from school? Do I step away from a current job? Do I step away from my current opportunities and stuff like that? And I've had a lot of people kind of like say, oh, you're, you're so... You're so brave or you took such a big risk. And in my eyes, I don't see it that way. Because in my eyes, like, I'm not, all I'm gambling on is, like, myself. And so as long as I'm confident in myself, like, things are going to work out. I develop my own skills to build my own product. And so that already is kind of, like, a plan B. If things go wrong, if Scan were tomorrow, tomorrow like, just, like, fall on its face and die, I still have my personal skills that I was able to acquire so that I could then, you know, go out and build an, another app or something next. And then just even on something as big as, like, the financial side of things. It's really scary to step away from a salary or a current job and go pursue your own thing. And maybe that's, um, like, in, in the life of an entrepreneur, if you're starting your own thing, you're just building, building your product, building your business, and you're not getting paid. The only way you're going to get paid is if you start making sales or you start doing whatever to make money yourself, or if you take on funding, that's also a point where you can take from that funding. Like when Google invested $1.7 in us, we could then pull a salary and start to pay ourselves a salary, and then it made it a lot easier, again, to step away from other opportunities or other jobs. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so the whole app store is just a giant game of trying to be at the top, right? Um, everything from just the quality of your app affects it, but then probably more than that, just how, how many downloads you're getting and how many ratings you're getting. And every time you submit an update, yeah, you are risking like losing that ranking. For us, it's not so much a game of ranking, although we've always done well. Like When we were a free app, we were number 10 in the entire app store and number one in our category being utilities. And then when we switched to paid, it was a whole different game. Um, but some apps just like thrive on having a good ranking because that's how they get discovered. Going back to earlier what I was saying, for us, it's not so much a game of ranking, it's more of a game of discoverability. So if somebody's gonna download our app, it's because they are at home, they're shopping wherever, and they see a barcode and they want to scan it, and in that way, like, every barcode or QR code out in the world is like a mini advertisement saying, download some app that can scan me. And that's where we need to, like, be in their face. That's where we need to be discoverable. And so I, I guess just kind of a more broad advice or answer to that question is if, you're, uh, if you have an app and you want to get the downloads, you need to decide, like, is that going to come from having a high ranking or is that going to come from de being discoverable? If that's going to come from having a high ranking, then your game is getting downloads however you can, and then the five-star ratings. Like, that is money for apps, is the five-star ratings. When our uh, app switched to paid, we went from, you know, a number one app in free utilities to just off the charts. Like, we, we couldn't be found, and we just totally lost our ranking because we had switched it to a paid app right before the sh TV show Shark Tank. And then we got that massive exposure through Shark Tank, and that brought us, you know, the downloads. People liked it. They gave us the five-star ratings. And then we moved into the paid section, into the number one spot, again, in utilities, but as a paid app. Good question, yeah? Um, I'm curious about, like, your both business model or revenue stream. So is it, I'm assuming initially it was from the investments, and then you, you had revenue from there, and you are building and paying yourself. And then is it mostly now from people downloading, or do you have, like, ad revenue as well with Okay, so that's a good question. The question is about like the revenue model and the monies, that kind of stuff. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe it would have helped if I was a business student and I would have had better like financial projections and like official stuff like that. But when we started, like that wasn't this. That wasn't the scenario. The scenario was like let's build as cool a product as possible, and that was it. Kind of the mindset, like, if you build something of value, like, it'll market itself, it'll sell itself, and it'll somehow, like, bring you finances, <laughs> uh, uh, make you money, right? Anyway, so it started off as simple as that. Um, 
and I can even remember like my first meeting with Ben and Kirk when we were meeting in our dorm room and we were saying like, let's build this app. And Kirk, my co-founder who's more money-minded, he kind of was wanting to like push like goals and numbers. And so he's like, what if we could make, get 1 million downloads and somehow, some way make $5,000 off of this project? Like that was our goal in the beginning was to make $5,000. Anyways, I wasn't one to shoot down his dreams. And so I was like, I think we could make $5,000 off of this. Um, and I mean, we're, it just escalated from there where as we started getting downloads, that's when the investors came in. Um, and, uh, and it was when the investors came in and they started asking you like official questions, like legit questions. What is your revenue model? What is this? What is this? And in the first meetings, we just looked like fools because we didn't have answers to those questions. But we at least learned in the initial meetings like what investors wanted to hear so that we could then go back, make plans, get answers to those questions, and then have better answers the next time around. And so for us, that meant like, um, that brings us to like today. What is our business model as of today? Having raised over $8 million from investors and wanting to be able to make them even more money. And it would be this. Um, the plan was to always keep the app free for our users. And then on the website of things, as businesses come to our website and they ask, here, I'll show you this. Um, this were the, these were the two initial products we launched. We launched a mobile app and a website. As businesses would come to the website, they could generate their own custom codes. And that's where we would make the money, is charging businesses. So again, free for the user, and then charge the businesses. But honestly, this is changing every day, where we still plan, and like our top priority is to be making money from the businesses. But when we see opportunities, like that's the startup life. We're young and agile enough that we can just you know, change and try out new things. And so charging for our app and making it from a free app to a $2 app now was just an experiment, an experiment that went really well for us. And so we just keep going with that. So that's kind of been the background uh, so far as to uh, Scan's revenue model. Good question. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about uh, what is the product? Yeah, so that to me, again, like I said before, is one of the most important parts of this entire story, like at least for my life. Because when I had the idea and I just couldn't bring it to life. Like, that was really hard for me. Um, so this is what I started to do. First, I learned, like, what skills were necessary to build my app. And it was design and development, right? And so I, I mean, actually, it was my wife that, like, first introduced me to Photoshop and first introduced me to coding, like, HTML and CSS, like, really basic stuff. And so first, I was just doing it whenever I could, just on my own, like, fun projects. And my own personal, this is my personal website, GarrettG.me. And that was just kind of became my playground where I could mess up and fool around and like, experiment with new things. And uh, nobody would care. Nobody would see it. And then when I got my confidence up enough, I started to build things for my friends and my family. And then when I got, you know, a little more confidence, I started to build things for other people and try to make money from it. So this was, this was before I ever built Scan. This is just me trying to learn these skills, right? Um, anyways, at first I started to charge people, I think it was like $16 an hour for these, you know, for design services or coding services. And it was just funny because people would treat me very poorly when I was charging $16 an hour. They would say something like, oh, so you're not very good? And I'd be like, what are you talking about? So the next time I charged $24 an hour. And they would still like, oh, so you just must be a student. Uh, all right. And they wouldn't treat me very well. Anyways, I started to charge more and more, just almost out of an experiment. Like, how, what's it going to take for people to treat me better? <laughs> and it got to the point where I was like, OK, I'm going to charge you like 100 bucks an hour. And people would be like, oh, you must be good. OK, like, let's do a project together. And I was just like, <laughs> all right. Anyways, what ended up happening was like these skills, I'm a huge advocate to anyone who's willing to like you know, buckle down and learn the skills of either design or coding because they are just in such high demand. To the point where even when I was charging $100 an hour, like, there were just endless, like, multiple emails a day of people were like, will you do this for me, will you do this for me? And I just had more work than I could handle. However, I've always been somewhat of a yes man, and it's really hard for me to turn down opportunities. And so I just, I just didn't know what to do. Like, I want to say yes to these people, but I 
don't have enough time. Like I'm getting more work than, than I can even, even handle. So I thought I had what was a brilliant idea. I'm just gonna charge so much money that they'll say no to me. And that way I don't have to say no to them. And so people would come to me and like, hey, will you build this website or will you design this logo, whatever it was. And I'd be like, yeah, but you should probably just work with like one of my buddies. I have a list of guys who could do it for you. I'm really busy and they'll do a really good job and they'll do it for a ton cheaper than I will. They're like, well, how much do you cost? Uh, I'm $300 an hour. And they'd be like, whoa, you must be really good. Let's do this. I was like, really? You're gonna still hire me? Anyway, so it went from, you know, knowing absolutely nothing about this to making really good money doing it, but more importantly to me, like, learning the skills. In one year, it was what? It was like 52 websites and over 70 logos that I had worked on in one year alone. And at the end of that year, more important than having made good money that year was I now had the skills ready to go out and take my idea and actually work on my own idea. And that's when I started working on Scan. So that was a good question. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to, let's see, um, I'm actually going to talk, so the question is, the return to Utah, why the return to Utah, how did that come about, and I don't know, okay, and then how, how balancing everything from this crazy girl, my daughter, um, soccer, family, business, all of that, um, so the first part, the return to Utah, actually, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm excited that I'm here because I can actually speak about this in a different way than I've ever spoken about it before. Because usually my answer is, I always do whatever's best for the business, and going back to Utah was best for the business. Like, that would be my answer, was I somewhere else. But being here, you know, on a BYU campus, I feel like I can actually, like, tell a little more of the truth and what went down. And that's this. Um, when I moved out to San Francisco... I thought I was like joining the big leagues of the tech industry, which I was. Like Silicon Valley is the most amazing place in the world for the tech industry and so many other things. Um, but what I didn't know is I would be meeting some of my like idols and heroes. There were people out there that were founders of the biggest tech companies that I looked up to, I wanted to be like, or at least I thought I wanted to be like. And out there, you know, I was hanging out, uh, going to like the San Francisco Giants games and their box suites and hanging out with these millionaires and their billionaires and their fancy cars. Like from an outsider's perspective, like that was the life, right? But what I didn't, um, what I didn't intend or I didn't uh, expect was kind of how empty it would feel for me. Like my life didn't have as much meaning out there when I was doing nothing but working on my business and even though I could kind of like see my future, like, oh, I'm going to be one of these guys that I, I, you know, there's a potential that I could make a lot of money and my company is going to be really big and I'll have a similar fancy car as them, like all that stuff. To my surprise, I was more jealous when I would travel back home for like a family barbecue or see my buddies still playing soccer and like that type of stuff. Like I was more jealous of their lives than I were of these guys that I was hanging out with in Silicon Valley. Anyways... That just like straight up scared me and I don't know, like I can't say that was a full reason but like the business started to do uh, worse while we were out there. Like everything just kind of seemed to be like digressing while I was out there. Anyways, it scared me to the point where I just needed to immediately shake things up and that's when we decided we were going back to Utah, we were moving the whole company back to Utah, we were kind of getting our lives back and then me individually, I was kind of like capturing my youth, I was going back going back to school, going back to playing soccer, um, and uh, I guess, like, yeah, going back to Utah. Anyways, and so that brings to the balance of things, how, how have I been able to uh, balance all of that? And to be honest, like, mm, I don't know, maybe, maybe if somebody uh, saw my life from the outside, like, they think I'm really busy, I personally don't feel that busy because everything I do absolutely love. Like if I wake up and I'm working on my app designing, I love doing that. Like that's what I would do on a weekend. If I uh, wake up because I have soccer practice, like I love playing soccer. If I don't have either of those that day and I'm just hanging out with my family, like obviously I love that. 
And so by surrounding my life and filling my life with just things that I'm absolutely passionate about, like in that way I've been able to, I don't know, like I was explaining it to my brother this way the other day. I said, I kind of feel like my life is like Saturday every day. Because what do you do on Saturdays? Like if you're not too tired from like work and stuff that like you don't care about, if you just, you know, kind of like going back to when you were a kid and you wake up and you have your Cocoa Puffs and you have your Saturday morning cartoons, like that is what you want to be doing. That's kind of how I feel currently. I wake up every day without a boss, without an agenda, like anything, and I just do like what I want to be doing that day. And usually that is playing soccer, working on my business, hanging out with my family, traveling to BYU Hawaii, <laughs> stuff like that, right? Um, and so yeah, the balance really hasn't been that hard for me. That's a good question, thanks. What are some of the, between the span of three years, what are some, some of the biggest roadblocks that you face and how you've overcome them? Ah, the biggest roadblocks. This is, this is probably one of the harder questions people give me just because, because I'm a foolish optimist. Like, I don't really see roadblocks as roadblocks. Uh, I haven't really felt like any like, super intense challenges. Um, let me think if I can actually... Yeah, I mean, honestly, <laughs> I don't know if it's just been a very blessed journey up until this point. Um, I'm sure every day there's just more and more hard things that come along. But, yeah, it's just, I, I don't know, maybe I just don't see them as roadblocks. I just see them as, like, fun challenges um, to take on. But, yeah, what would, I guess this would be one thing. This was, okay, the question is, what was some of the harder, harder times or roadblocks is scan? And this is one. When we moved out to San Francisco, we were acting like a business because we had just raised money from Google and we thought that meant we needed to start acting like a business. And I grew my team from the three of us co-founders and we started to hire good employees. And we grew the team to 16 people. Okay, so we're out in San Francisco, there's 16 of us. And what I realized is like, like we weren't acting like a startup anymore, we were acting like a business where there were good employees and they had managers and I was the boss and I did not like being a boss. Like, I'm just not a bossy type of guy. I'm not a boss man, and I didn't like that. Anyways, and so that was at that same time that I was saying, like, the business started to digress. It just started doing worse and worse, and that scared me. And so me and my co-founders talked, like, what do we need to do to stop, like, to fix this? I don't want to feel like a business anymore. And so we decided, okay, we're going to make the change from a business back to a startup, and that means letting go of everybody, firing anyone that was an employee, or acted like an employee, or I guess better said, like needed a boss. And that was hard for me, because I cared about each one of those people, like a lot of them were close friends, but we needed to do it for like the sake of the business, you know, for the, for, uh, for the company. Anyway, so one weekend we decided, okay, we have 16 employees. Who of these 16 act like an employee and who acts like a founder? We need founders to start off with. Anyways, that weekend we ended up going from a company of 16 people to a company of just five people. And that was honestly like the worst weekend of my life, having to let those people go. Um, looking back, it was like the right thing. Those people have been better off and the company has been better off. But yeah, that was probably the hardest part of running this business so far. Mm -hmm. Here, what, what do you see when you go talk to investors? What do they want to hear apart from a return on investment? So the question is, what do investors want to hear? Um, I'm always, I'm kind of curious myself because I've always, like, this is my first time having done a business, this is my first time working with investors. And so a question in my own mind is like, how different was my story and my interaction with investors from like the typical ones? But I'll tell you kind of how it went down for me. Um, let's go back to when I started to first get emails and phone calls from investors. Um, it was when some San Francisco, like Google and a few other like big name investors reached out to us that we finally did decided to take some meetings. And I went to a professor of mine at BYU Provo and said, hey, I have these investor meetings, like how do I prepare, what do I do? And they said, oh, you gotta have, you gotta have financial projections, which I wasn't very good at. You need to have like market research slides, which I wasn't very good at. And you need to wear a suit and tie, 
which I'm not very good at. And so then, and, and so I did. I tried it. I wore a suit and tie. I did all these like number slides, financial projections, and like legit stuff like that. And I went into my first meetings with investors. And this is a slide from that very first meeting where I got to that first meeting two hours early and I didn't want to waste time. So I pulled up the map on my phone and like pins started to drop about what was nearby. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. In Silicon Valley, there's a road called Sand Hill Road and that's where all the investors, like major investors are all along this one road. I was like, this is so convenient. While I'm waiting for this meeting, I'm just gonna go meet with all these investors. And so I literally went door to door trying to get meetings. I'd be like, hey, I'm here, I'm meeting with these guys, but I'm here early, so can I meet with you? And every single one of them, like they all have the secretary up front, and every single one of those secretaries looked at me like, you lost little boy that has no clue what you're doing, like we do not want to meet with you. And not a single one of them would meet with me that first time. Anyways, and I went into that first meeting, two hours later, I had my suit and tie, I talked about financials. Basically what I learned is I'm really bad at faking things that aren't what I'm naturally passionate about. And those first meetings just went horribly, horribly. Um, to the point where I was like, I do no, not want to meet with another investor ever again. And so, I don't know, after a while of investors like continuing to hit us up and me being like, no, I tried that, I don't want to meet with you. Finally, I was like, okay, I will take another meeting with an investor, but I'm going to do things my way. So put on my sandals, <laughs> put on my jeans, put on my cap, and I just went like as myself. And I even like, even my slide deck, when I'd go and meet with them and talk about my company, I took out anything I didn't personally care about, which was like the projections and the numbers and the cap tables and like that type of stuff. And all I talked about was stuff that I was passionate about. I talked about my team, my talented team. I talked about the product that we had worked hard to build. And then I talked about our vision, like what we want to do and how we want to change the world. Anyways, they like that, but I think more importantly, just looking back at how those meetings went, I think the more important part was because I was talking about something I was passionate about, they just saw like the confidence and like the light and the, the ambition inside me as I was talking about these things. And you know, looking back, you'll talk to a lot of these uh, investors who have now invested and they'll just, I think they just kind of see me as, yeah, his ideas might be like off the wall and a little foolish, but he believes in it and he's just gonna work hard and make it happen. It wasn't like that official. And that's why I'd be interested myself to see how other investor meetings go, like how many of them are that random and off the wall and how many of them just talk about like the facts and the stats and the spreadsheets like that investors typically want to hear. So, yep. How did you pick your partners and how did you like divide up your company in the beginning? Yeah, so that question is how did I pick my co-founders and how did we split up the company? That part is super important part. Like co-found, who in here, just by raise of hands, who in here is married? Oh, quite a bit. So yeah, so this is gonna work out well. I kind of think of it this way, like picking your co-founders is like dating and eventually it's like marriage where it is super important because you're gonna be on a long road with them moving forward and you need to get along well, you need to just like have that special chemistry. Um, so for me, knowing what I wanted, that I wanted to work with the best of the best developers on campus, um, what I started to personally do is I started to go to any campus or uh, club or event that I could, and if I could, I wanted to get on stage, I wanted to talk so I could basically like meet everyone at the same time and let people know this is who I am, this is what I'm working on, and this is what I'm looking for. What I was looking for were co-founders. And it got to the point where you could go to any event on campus and people were like, yeah, scared you again, and we all know what he's looking for, he still hasn't found it. And I did that for months in Provo. Um, until finally I went to one event called Web Startup Group. And the, it was the same format where you'd get up on stage and you'd say, this is who I am, this is what I'm working on, and this is what I'm looking for. And the people before me had said the same thing, like this is my idea and I'm looking for a developer, a coder. And they would like look out in the crowd, nobody would raise their hand, like nobody was there. So by the time I got up last, I was like, I'm looking for a coder, but I know there's not one here, so thanks for your time. Like, See you later. Uh, but it was after that meeting that Ben, my now co-founder, came up to me and was like, hey, really good presentation. I really liked everything you had to say. I was like, oh, thanks. Like, I didn't see you. Like, who are you? 
And he kind of like got all like timid and scared and leaned in and he literally like whispered, he's like, I'm a developer. And I was like, oh, okay. Like developers know like how valuable they are and how valuable their skills are. And so anyways, that's when he and I first met. But again, relating this to dating, I didn't just like jump right in and be like, let's get married. Uh, we started doing like projects together, like small projects. I like made him business cards. I started to take him out to lunch. I guess you could say I started to court him or <laughs> try to, you know, win him over. And it was the same thing with Kirk. Like these guys at the time, I was a freshman. I kind of knew how to code and I was confident that I could design very well. But they were like, they were seniors and they were the best of the best. Their reputation on campus was you can go to them for advice, but don't try to team up with them. Like they're that good. Anyways. I courted them and I courted them and then when I felt like the mood was right, <laughs> I proposed, I said, this is my project, do you want to team up with me? And we, this was like an important thing, but I said, look, from the beginning, I just want this to be equal. Like, I don't know if this is going to be a success or if this is going to be a failure, but I want to be equal teammates. And so from the beginning, we split it up equally, 33, 33, 33. And with the understanding that as this grows, like let's just always stay as even as possible. And so far, we've been able to do that. So, all right, is that the last one? One more question. One more question. Yeah, right here. What was your major? My major is, I think for a little bit, or once upon a time, I, I was an industrial design major, a product design major at BYU, but that didn't last very long for me. Um, I had a hard time, like, I think in any major this is true, and actually I think here at BYU Hawaii you can like create your own major. If that was possible at Provo, like, that's what I would have done. But yeah, currently I'm not in a major because as far as I see it, like, every major at BYU Provo has some really good classes, but it's also gonna have like one or two week classes. And I didn't wanna waste the time in one of those, you know, weaker classes, and so I still have yet to have joined a major. I just kind of pick and choose the best from wherever I can. Don't know if that'll end up in a, uh, like a degree for me eventually, but that's kind of the path that's been so far. So, anyways, uh, thank you guys. I've had just, I'm excited to be here at BYU Hawaii, and anytime there's anything I can help with, like everything that I talked about has been possible because of people who have helped me. Like. Being a rookie, doing things the way I've done it would just be impossible if I didn't have people who knew more than me and kind of had done this before me helping me. So if there's any way I can ever help you guys, just let me know. So thanks, guys.